drivers, Andretti, Ryan hunter Ray, and Alexander Rossi, all tried to chase down the Kiwi, but none could pull off a move for the lead. Scott Dixon beats hunter Ray to the checkers by nearly two seconds to record his 40-second career win. That ties him for third on the all-time IndyCar win list with Michael Andretti. Yeah, Firestone is always do a fantastic job. You know, uh, for us this, this year, we, we typically struggle a little bit on the tyres uh, here at Detroit, but uh, the team did a fantastic job of getting the setup better. And uh, as always, a, a huge uh, thank you to, to Firestone and their whole engineering group. Honda dominates race one in Chevy's backyard, taking the top five spots at the finish, with Dixon and Hunter Ray followed across the line by Rossi, Andretti, and Takuma Sato. Indy 500 winner Will Power, the top Chevy-powered driver, finishing seventh. With his third place run, Alexander Rossi goes back to the top of the championship standings. Dixon now runs second, just four points back. Power drops to third, seven back, with New Garden and Hunter Ray filling out the top five, heading into the second half of the Detroit doubleheader. Enjoy today's race. I'm Mike King. This is the Firestone Performance Report. Whatever you drive, drive a Firestone. Uh, thanks, Mike, uh, for the recap of yesterday's race at number one. Well, the historian of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, Donald Davidson, joins us now. He has, as always, his moment in motorsports history. The most recent running of the Indianapolis 500 had 30 changes of lead. And while that is one more than the longtime record of 29, established back in 1960, it's nowhere near the record as it currently stands. That 1960 record held up for over 50 years until 2012, when it was finally surpassed by 34 lead changes. And how long did that one last? Exactly one year, when not only did it get beaten, but incredibly enough, it was doubled. 14 drivers exchanging the lead an unbelievable 68 times. Three years later, there was a pretty formidable challenge to that when 13 drivers swapped the lead 58 times. But it hasn't always been this way. By comparison, how about 1965 when winner to be Jim Clark outsped pole sitter A.J. Foyt to lead the opening lap, then bowed to Foyt on lap two and regained it a lap later. Clark then held it from that point until lap 76 when he made his first of two stops for fuel, allowing Foyt to return to the front for nine laps before he too had to come in. Clark was never headed after that, the summer is showing that just four lead changes took place with Foyt out front for 10 laps and Clark the remaining 190. Was that unusual? Well, not back then and in the earlier days, there were several occasions when the eventual winner would lead for the entire second half. And the most extreme example ever? In 1930, Paul said a Billy Arnold bow to Louis Meyer on laps one and two and then took over for good. The summary, Louis Meyer, two laps, Billy Arnold, 198. Total changes of lead? One. This has been Donald Davidson with another moment in motorsports history. Order your tickets now for the 103rd running of the Indianapolis 500. For details, go to IMS.com. Uh, moving closer to pre-race festivities, and we will hear from our driver, analyst, Anders Krohn, when we come back. Firestone presents legendary drives, super speedways, short ovals, dry tracks, wet tracks, concrete or asphalt. The IndyCar Series is the ultimate test for a driver. And being a driver that can adapt to anything means having a tire that can do the same. That's why we build Firestone tires to handle it all. Because if they can endure all that, well, you can bet they'll bring you to victory every day. Whatever you drive, drive a Firestone, the tire that drives IndyCar legends. I'm a one-trick pony, literally. I show up at kids' parties and act cute. That's pretty much it. So excuse me for being bitter when Geico says not only could we save you money on car insurance, but we do more, like give you 24-7 access online, over the phone, or even via our award-winning mobile app. Well, ooh la la, aren't they multi-talented? <laughs> hey, I said organic carrots. <laughs> Geico. Expect great savings and a whole lot more. From the streets of Belle Isle, this is the Advance Auto Parts IndyCar Radio Network. 
Ever wonder how the credit card companies make their money? Well, think about this. If you owe $25,000 on five different credit cards and you make your minimum payments every month, here's what it's going to cost you. Are you sitting down? You'll shell out over thirteen grand in additional interest and it's going to take over 13 years to pay off your original $25,000 balance. That's how they make money. Now it's your turn to fight back by calling the Debt Solution. Network. We'll work on your behalf to reduce your debt. We specialize in credit cards, retail store cards, and medical bills. We promise we can and will reduce your debt. Call right now for a free 15 minute debt analysis. 800 709 4392. 800 709 4392. 800 709 4392. 800 709 4392. From the Firestone Broadcast booth at Belle Isle, this is the Verizon IndyCar Series. Uh, Mark James, Anders Krull joins us now in the booth. Uh, a, a preview of this event today. Two stops, three stops. Folks are going to try those strategies today. How much did uh, qualifying and the wets affect this uh, the race and the lineup today? Well, I think the biggest thing it did is it removed any rubber from the racing surface. So uh, certainly they're going to have to go back to the drawing board a little bit and, and maybe reevaluate some setups from the from the first day of practice because, yeah, that, that rainfall there was then followed by a stadium super truck race, which then took off even more rubber so i think it could be a little bit going back to the uh, uh, again to the to the starting setups for a lot of teams and drivers here i think uh, what we're going to see from the top five is probably a more of a of a regular sort of two-stop strategy but wouldn't be surprised to see any of the uh, any of the drivers a little bit further back graham ray hall ryan hunter ray marco andretti potentially opting for a three-stop stop strategy trying to get some clear traffic uh, on on track uh, before we go track side we do want to update you on the points after yesterday's race alex Alexander Rossi leads Scott Dixon by four. Will Power is seven back now. Joseph Newgarden, 21 back. Ryan Hunter Ray, 49 back. Robert Wickens could really get back into contention, 75 points back. For Dixon now, 14 consecutive seasons with at least one win, 16 seasons overall with at least one win. 42nd win, tied with Michael for third all time now, trailing AJ and Mario. Let's go trackside. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time we ask that you please rise and remove your hats as the soldiers from the U.S. Army Garrison, Detroit Arsenal, present our nation's colors. Please remain standing as Father Theodore Munz, President of the University of Detroit's Jesuit High School and Academy, offers this afternoon's invocation. Let us pray. Uh, first, dear Lord, I don't think you had to wait this long for the blue skies, but thanks for them. And second, uh, we say prayers for Paul Morris, whose uh, truck overturned in the prior race. All powerful and ever living God, all creation is yours and everything is of your making. We humbly thank you for all the gifts of creation that you have given us that we may give praise and honor to your name. Today, we thank you for the 29th Chevrolet Detroit Grand Prix presented by Lear. We find joy in your presence at this race and find true delight in being part of it. Thank you for the power, the beauty, and the craftsmanship of the cars and for all who labored to build them. Thank you for the wit, ingenuity, reflex, and daring of the drivers. We thank you for the efficiency and passion of the crews. We thank you for Chairman Danker and his team who have transformed this beautiful island for our pleasure. Finally, dear Lord, thank you for all the spectators. We now implore you to bless this race and keep all drivers crews and spectators safe as you have united us as brothers and sisters in your name so give us the grace to love our neighbors as you as you have loved us may this race be to your honor and glory you who are lord forever and ever amen 
Race fans, Daily in the United States National Anthems, please welcome Detroit's own Ty Stone. Oh, Canada, our home and native land. True patriot love in all of us command. With glowing hearts we see thee rise, the true north strong and free. From far and wide, O oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. God, keep our land glorious and free. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free? And the home of the brave. Two A-10s to fly over today. The 47th Fighter Squadron, Davis Month at Air Force Base in Arizona. Now let's meet the ADT starting lineup. Here's today's starting lineup. Row 12. Rene Binda, Austria. Row 11. Tony Kanan, Brazil. Charlie Kimball, United States. Row 10. Takuma Sato, Japan. Joseph Newgarden, United States. Row 9. Matheus Leist, Brazil. Max Chilton, England. Row 8. Sébastien Bourdet, Le Mans, France. Spencer Piggott, United States of America. Row 7. Gabby Chavez, Colombia. Santino Ferrucci, Connecticut. Row 7. Six. Marco Andretti, United States. Jordan King, Britain. Row five. Ryan Hunter Ray, United States. Graham Rahal, United States of America. Row four. Simon Pagenaud, France. Zach Beach, United States. Row three. James Hinchcliffe, Canada. Scott Dixon, New Zealand. Row two. Ed Jones, Dubai. Will Power, Australia. On the outside of row one. Robert Wickens, Canada. And starting on the pole. Alexander Rossi, United States. Today's starting lineup is brought to you by ADT. Introducing ADT to go. The new family mobile safety app and service. Go to ADT.com to learn more today. This is NHRA Funny Car Driver, Courtney Force. Time to head to Advance Auto Parts for low prices and tons of free services. We offer free battery starter and alternator testing and free battery installation with purchase. Plus, Speed Perks members earn up to $20 in rewards. Don't miss out. Visit an Advance or participating CarQuest Auto Parts store near you today. Advance Auto Parts. Let's get you back on the road. 
what's it like to drive an Indy car at the famed Indianapolis Motor Speedway? Now the Indy Racing Experience can put you in the driver's seat. That's right. You can drive an Indy car at the world's greatest race course. Packages started under $500. But hurry, sessions are selling out fast. Call 888-357-5002 or go online to IndyRacingExperience.com. You driving a real Indy car. Call 888-357-5002 now. From the streets of Belle Isle, this is the Advance Auto Parts IndyCar Radio Network. If you're 85 or younger, would you like peace of mind and comfort for your family? We're Final Expense Direct with an urgent message for you. The average funeral today costs over $8,000, but the most you'll get from government benefits is $255. How will your family pay the difference? We can help. Our senior plans start as low as just a dollar a day and pay up to $30,000 for a funeral and other final expenses. Peace of mind is easy. There's no medical exam. You'll have lifetime coverage, and your plan can't be canceled as long as you pay your premiums. Call now for free information about our senior plans. Answer a few simple questions and receive approval right on the phone. Plus, call right now and we'll give you a discount prescription card for free. Call 800-561-4721. That's 800-561-4721. Again, 800-561-4721. From the Firestone Broadcast booth at Belle Isle, this is the Verizon IndyCar Series. Welcome back to Belle Isle in Detroit, and we're pleased to have with us by phone Clea Newman. Uh, the last name certainly needs no introduction, and uh, we want to talk a little bit about this latest effort that the Verizon IndyCar Series is involved in. Serious Fun Children's Network, and uh, Clea, of course, this is a, a, a match uh, made in heaven, going back to the early days of the Hole in the Wall uh, camps with uh, uh, Paul Newman's love for racing and the racing community and his love for kids. My father always said there were only two places he could truly be himself, on the track and, you know, in the with the racing community and at camp with the kids. Well, let's talk about how this partnership makes sense for both organizations. We're just absolutely so grateful that the racing community has embraced it so much. Um, you know, we even have had some, some campers and their families come to the track and drivers have welcome them and um you know it's just been an absolute pleasure but you know this is a it's really important for us to kind of get the the word out and awareness for the camps and how extraordinarily beneficial they are for our kids and let's face it studies have shown that uh, if you keep kids active challenge them a little bit give them an opportunity to be in a loving nurturing environment it actually aids in the healing process when you send a child to camp and you give them the support that they need and and the love and affection in in an environment where they're surrounded by other kids who understand what they're going through you know in a really kind of specific programming for them when they come back into the family unit when they come back into their family they've regained all this wonderful confidence and they're kind of almost returning to the child that they were before their illness. Well, Clay and Newman, we, we, it's easy for people to get involved and support it financially. They can text kids to 900-900. Also give directly to Sirius Fund at www.seriousfundnetwork.org backslash Indie Giving. Congratulations on um, on allowing this project and this effort to, to, to live on, and congratulations on your association with the Verizon IndyCar Series. It's a win-win for sure. Thank you so much for having me on. Make your home an ADT home and help protect against break-ins, fire, and carbon monoxide. Get our lowest rate for fast response monitoring, starting at just $28.99 a month. That's about a dollar a day from the most trusted name in home security. Get ADT's tested, trusted, and proven security and service now at a great value. Don't wait. Call today. ADT. Always there. Now everywhere. Requires 36-month monitoring contract. Early termination, taxes, and cell fees apply. Certain markets excluded. See terms and pricing at ADT.com. 
Firestone presents Legendary Drives. The scariest thing in sports is a left turn taken at over 220 miles an hour. Turn one at the Indy 500 demands everything a tire's got, putting 2.5 Gs on them for four seconds. Once it's over, they only have to do it 199 more times. And if Firestone tires are so dependable they can handle turn one, they'll handle any turn you need to make. Whatever you drive, drive a Firestone, the tire that drives IndyCar legends. From the streets of Belle Isle, this is the Advance Auto Parts IndyCar Radio Network. It can be a scarier world for a hospitalized child often facing painful medical treatments and procedures. That's why a visit from an IndyCar driver can be so uplifting and helpful to each child's recovery therapy. For 29 years, Racing for Kids has been taking IndyCar drivers to visit these children before every race, bringing bright smiles and laughter into their rooms and hope into their lives. Racing for Kids and IndyCar, helping sick children get better faster through motorsports. For more information and to donate, go to racingforkids.org. Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the Brickyard, Brickyard 400, Gasoline Alley, the greatest spectacle in racing, racing capital of the world, Indy, Indy 500, Indianapolis 500, IndyCar, Indy Lights, and Indy Racing League are trademarks owned and or licensed by Brickyard Trademarks. Firestone is a trademark owned and or licensed by Bridgestone Firestone North American Tire. Any rebroadcast, reproduction, or other use of the information, descriptions, and content of this broadcast without the prior written consent of the IMS Radio Network is strictly prohibited. This broadcast is a copyrighted presentation of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Radio Network. From the Firestone Broadcast booth at Belle Isle, this is the Verizon IndyCar Series. Uh, 70 laps today, 2.35 miles in length is this course. The 14-turn temporary street course. And again today, to help us call the action, we'll welcome in first tie and top turn number six, Jake Query. Good afternoon to you, Mark. It's great to be back here in Belle Isle for a second straight day, in particular because the rain that we had during the qualifying session has completely gone away and now it is a sun splash race course as a matter of fact i am down as you mentioned in turn number six it is the far south end really the southeast corner of this fantastic state park bell isle just behind me is the detroit river and just on the other side of that is windsor canada but of course these drivers don't want to make it that far they're going to have that right-handed turn that is just below me technically speaking i can see turn five as well that's a left-handed turn that leads to a bit of a squiggle before they make this right-handed turn number six. The balance can get tricky when they make that right-handed turn because of the crowning of the road itself. It wants to push that car a little bit too far to the outside, but you've got to mind your P's and Q's because that pure Michigan signage is right there waiting for you if you don't get the car straight in enough time. It's underneath a pure Michigan bridge, then a slight kink, and then a long straightaway leading them into turn number seven. When they do that, they'll have a lot of speed, but should they have the time to do so, they can look up and say hi to Nick Yeoman. Yeah, and we saw plenty of drivers maybe attempt to say hi as they went side-by-side side yesterday in race number one. You mentioned that straightaway. It bends to the right, back to the left before these drivers uh, make their way onto the brake pedal and try to slow those cars down for a hard right-hand turn after they clear the Corvette Bridge. The curbing to the inside of the corner is blue and white. You could probably fit about four or five cars in this portion of the racetrack, but with that curbing, you're going to be lucky to go two, maybe three wide. We saw him try it yesterday, and as we know, patience is always in short supply when you race back-to-back -back races. So we'll see if these drivers take care of each other today, but no doubt this is one of the best passing portions on the racetrack. Detroit River to my right. You've got the casino to the left, the fountain, and the skyline of the city of Detroit to my back. And most importantly, Mark Jane's right above me, some sunshine. We haven't seen a lot of it so far today. Rained out, or a lot of rain during qualifying in which Alexander Rossi grabbed the pole, but right now it's turned into a pretty beautiful day here in the Motor City. Uh, I talked to Zach Feach back in the paddock uh, in between qualifying and uh, Anders Krohn. He said, I asked him about seven back around to two, as we talked about yesterday. Not much time to quote unquote breathe, if you will. And he said, honestly, anywhere, if you're going to kind of quote unquote rest anywhere in that segment, it's 
seven, eight, nine, ten, because he said the one thing you don't have to worry about, that's typically not a place where anybody's going to pass you. He said, but it's not easy by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, there. no, you, you're kept super busy all the way from turn seven all the way through to the front straight. But then again, turn one and turn two come up so quickly as well, and then it's a short breathe down to the breaking zone in turn three where the majority of the passing is going to be taking place. And But, but then turn three, four, five, six is just a back-to-back-to-back-to-back corner and uh, very, very similar uh, to Toronto, really, in, in the way of rhythm and, and kind of the fact that there's such little time to breathe. And that, of course, is why we're seeing, uh, you know, drivers like the Iceman, Scott Dixon, come to the fore because just able to stay cool and, and manage those bumps as well as uh, as they're able to. Uh, Firestone uh, got rave reviews after that qualifying session this morning for their new rain tire. I know you were hopeful to be able to use it in the race this afternoon. Um, we, we did learn some things about it. I mean, the drivers, everyone, very happy about it after the qualifying session. Yeah, and, and kind of the, the general consensus about the previous iteration of the rain tire is that it was almost more of an intermediate tire, something that you could dry on a or drive on a very drying track. But once it got really flooded and once there was a lot of surface on, on or, or water on the surface, it was difficult uh, for, for the tread to kind of break through that and, and really did spell enough water so uh, they've done a great job with just softening the compound right there making the pattern a little bit more aggressive so that if there is severe rain conditions like we saw at barber motorsports park uh, it should be a little bit easier for the drivers to manage did you see uh, what what were the differences as you would describe them between the reds and the blacks yesterday since we're going to stay on both of those today well certainly the uh, the ultimate peak in speed is going to come from the firestone reds but some drivers especially schmidt peterson motorsports james hinchcliffe and robbie wickens actually said that their balance kind of disappeared appears once they goes on to the Firestone red tire. So it's a little bit of a balance thing, but certainly the, the outright pace is going to be better on the reds, but the black certainly better for the long run. Uh, the 24th and 25th IndyCar races conducted here at the raceway at Belle Isle. The 27th and 28th uh, IndyCar races held in Detroit. And there was a two and a half mile street circuit in downtown that hosted card events from 89 to 91. Let's go trackside to get this race underway today. Race fans, it's time for the most famous words in all of sports. Please welcome today's Grand Marshal, General Motors Vice President of Global Vehicle Components and Subsystems, Ken Kelzer. Thanks, Michael. Drivers, start your engines. <laughs> So roar to life. Now Graham Rahal joins us, two-time winner a year ago. Had his struggles yesterday, but still, Graham gives us a very effective twisted T, twisted turn course description. Yeah, you come down, uh, you know, to start finish line. It's uh, the turn one right hander, turn two left hander, both, you know, really quick uh, fourth gear corners. Really important to have a good, you know. Obviously stable car, but a car that turns really well to be fast here. Come over the big crest onto the back straight. It's going to be your best passing zone down into uh, turn three. Uh, heavy braking, sixth gear down to uh, second. You know, tight 90 degree right. Another tight 90 degree right in uh, turn four, which is pretty bumpy and slippery with the concrete. So a lot of guys make mistakes there. And then turn five, the left hander is uh, just slippery, bumpy. Use all the road. Try not to hit the fence on the outside. Turn six lead down to the back straight. One of the most important corners because the back straight's another long straightaway. An area that a lot of guys struggle, and I've certainly struggled this weekend as well. Come down into seven, big break zone. Very smooth now with all the, the repave and the and the grinding that's been done. Sixth gear again, down to second. You know, kind of struggle with the rear off the corner. Down into eight, this is where there's no margin for error. You know, braking, the, the rear wants a lock, the outside front wants a lock, but it's a tight left-hander. Eight, nine, the fountain section, left-hander again, just kind of maintenance throttle, trying to hold the car through there. Turn 10 is tight right-hander. A lot of guys are uh, intrigued or, or, or look to make moves there, but it's not a great spot. You know, again, getting power down off of there is important. I've lost positions and game positions there before. And then again, the last two corners, uh, super bumpy on entry to 13, but it's probably one of the best corners around here. A lot of risk, reward, and then uh, 14 is good fun, and, you know, slide it on through there onto the front straight. And we have a major delay. The pace car hit the wall after the field pulled off a of pit road, came around the turn, and Anders, it, it came up on the, the two-seater, 
and for whatever the reason, uh, accelerated and spun and hit the wall, deploying the airbags. Well, exactly what Graham Rahal said in the in the Twisted T course preview here. He was on power going over that crest in turn two, and when you go on power over that crest, if you have any sort of steering input, the car's going to snap loose. It's the same in the race cars, and, and obviously a lot of horsepower from that uh, from that Chevy Corvette pace car, and yeah, he just spun it around and then hooked to the left and slammed into the barrier. I mean, that was that was a major, major incident. I, I just hope that the, the driver and passenger is okay. I saw the airbag was deployed on the passenger side. I did not see the airbag airbag being deployed on the on the driver's side. So certainly thoughts with the driver here and, and hope everything's okay. Well, they are getting ready to uh, attempt to clear the field to the left side. And Anders, you could look at the replay again. Yeah, and it's just super, super hard on the power as he goes over the crest and oh man oh man and the whole field's come to a halt behind the pace car we're now getting a view of the onboard footage here of alexander rossi and it's just super super hard on power and then bang into the wall for the for the pace car driver and obviously huge confusion here for the uh, for the drivers in the Verizon IndyCar series cars they would have had to have shut off their cars at this point in time probably going to have to uh, do a a full full restart here uh, so uh, let's uh, let's let's take a break and we'll come back and, and, and reset the scene for you here as a damage to the Ch Chevrolet pace car uh, before we ever get this race underway here in Detroit. Hey Google, play IndyCar radio on TuneIn. Next, you're holding up the line, ma'am. What did you say? You're next in line for the water slide, ma'am. Feet forward and enjoy the ride. Okay, dearie, this does look fun. Oh, you melted me. I've melted. The Wicked Witch of the West on a water slide? Surprising. What's not surprising? How much you could save by switching to Geico. See what you've done. Oh. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Hope you guys are enjoying today's action on IndyCar Radio. I'm James Hinchcliffe. And I am Alexander Rossi, and we are the hosts of Off Track with Hinch and Rossi. Alex and I are at the top of our game in the Verizon IndyCar series, and we're bringing in exceptional people at the top of their game, in and out of racing, to talk to about their crafts. Make sure you download the TuneIn app today to listen to our podcast and catch all of our races on IndyCar Radio. From the streets of Belle Isle, this is the Advance Auto Parts IndyCar Radio Network. Greece is cheap. But the airfare costs a fortune. Paris? Not much closer, and again, airfare... What about Puerto Vallarta? Let's face it, flying anywhere is just too expensive. Wait, what's this? Low-cost airlines. With one call to low-cost airlines, you'll drastically slash your travel costs. We're talking insanely low airline prices to any of your favorite destinations. Where would you like to go? London, Rome, Costa Rica, Australia? Wow, that's cheap. So why wait? Call now to learn how crazy cheap it is to fly anywhere in the U.S. or international. Our prices are so low, we can't publish them. The only way to get them is to call to instantly hear the most amazing best deals on airlines travel. It's that easy. So call now and start packing. 800-654-0759. 800-654-0759. 800-654-0759. That's 800-654-0759. From the Firestone Broadcast booth at Belle Isle, this is the Verizon IndyCar Series. Uh, a scene set here. The field is halted behind the pace car after it made contact with the wall. Uh, the pace car being driven uh, by General Motors Executive Vice President for Global Product Development, Mark Royce. Mark was our guest in the booth uh, for the uh, Indianapolis 500 last week. And, uh, and, and Anders, uh, we've seen the replay a couple of times. Alexander Rossi had a bird's eye view of it. And uh, you said you referred back to uh, Graham Rahal's course description and said that uh, uh, boy, that acceleration zone there is awfully tricky. Yeah, it, it is indeed, and it, it may say, seem like a silly, silly thing to do, but uh, but trust me, when you go over a crest like that with uh, with cold tires and a lot of horsepower, if you have any sort of G 
payload in the car, it, it, it's going to snap around on you. And then if you if you if you don't predict it, it it's definitely going to do exactly what just happened. So, but uh, obviously glad to see both uh, both the people from the uh, from the vehicle out and and safe and uninjured. And uh, but at the moment, the, the bottleneck that is created for the Verizon IndyCar Series drivers, the, obviously not not a good situation. And and this is. This is like the worst feeling as as a driver here sitting just waiting because you've been mentally preparing yourself for so long now uh, to, to start this race and to now just sit there and, and everything just heat soaks inside the car. All the all the heat from the engine kind of moves forward into the tub and around you and gets into your body and it, it almost becomes a bit of a claustrophobic feeling when you're sitting in the car and it's so warm and there's no movement of air or anything. So, um, yeah, uh, definitely uh, some pretty... Uh, strange circumstances here at the start of the race. The Oriel Servia will take over pace car responsibilities from this point forward. Uh, and they have another pace car for him, uh, and, and so Oriel Servia will take over piloting duties. But again, Oriel Servia, North Sarah Fisher, not behind the wheel for that incident. I just want to establish that indeed again was Mark Royce, the Executive Vice President, Global Product Development uh, for GM that was piloting the pace car along with uh, an IndyCar Series official and uh, boy, it couldn't have happened in a worse spot. I mean, they, they had initially attempted to get the cars moved around, get them back to pit road. But, you know, because of the impact, too, not only do they need to get the car removed, but there was a pretty decent debris field. There was, but I think the biggest thing that all drivers, except for Alexander Rossi, who actually did drive around to the pit lane, I think all the other drivers, once they came to a halt, they, they would have just turned their cars off to prevent them from overheating. These cars don't have uh, normal types of fans that you see on a production vehicle so they can sit still and idle for a long period of time. The, the, these cars will start overheating within within just a few seconds if they're standing still too, too long. So uh, all the drivers would have shut them off and obviously no onboard starters for any of the uh, any, any of the Indy cars. So, uh, yeah, smart decision for the drivers to shut these off, certainly. Uh, well, they're going to uh, get the cars restarted and then send them back around the course and send them back on to the pit road, uh, we could say that Alexander Rossi, for one, the only one, I believe, that was able to get back around. So let's hear from some of the team principals uh, on this situation. Let's start with Michael Young. Rob Edwards calls the shots for Alexander Rossi, and your driver had a bird's eye view of this incident. A very odd thing to have happen. I don't think anybody expected it. Did he say anything to you? Uh, he just said the pace car had, sp had spun and it crashed. And um, you know, then we were a little confused when they, they wanted everyone to stop, but we figured probably best to get back to pit lane and stop there. So uh, just waiting for everyone to get reorganized now. But yeah, certainly a new one on me. <laughs> so certainly concerns with the heat cycles of these Honda engines, having to shut them down, having to fire them back up. Any concern on your end? No, no concerns at all. I mean, it's same for everyone. And uh, you know, fortunately, the engine's still pretty cold. We just rolled off the grid. We, we ran, you know, at low speed all the way back to the pit lane again, so no, no concerns there. Good luck today. Thank you. Rob Edwards calls the shots for Alexander Rossi, who got his third pole earlier today. Ryan Marine. Mike Hole sits on Scott Dixon's PNC Bank pit stand. You were just exchanging uh, some comments over the radio, I noticed. What, what do you do in a situation like this? Is there anything in your protocol to handle it? Um, well, it's a red flag condition, first of all, so we obey the rules. Uh, certainly never seen anything quite like this uh, in IndyCar racing, uh, but, you know, we always talk about them, about the, something like this happening. Luckily, everybody, it appears, got through that okay, with the exception of the pace car. Uh, so uh, once we get going here, we're going to have a great race. What was the communication back to you initially? What did, did Scott tell you? He said that uh, there was a mess up there, and uh, he stalled it and uh, shut it off. And uh, we just waited then on uh, direction from IndyCar to do what's next for us here. We're now running, so we're headed back to the pit lane. All right. Thank you very much. That's Mike Cole. Let's go to Dave. Uh, Brian Herter right now on the radio to his driver, Marco Andretti. <laughs> Everybody's kind of chuckling about this. Have you ever seen anything like this, Brian? No, but you do this long enough, you see everything at least once. Yeah, that, make, that might be a good point. Uh, to your driver's point, the great race he had yesterday, started from pole at a top five, and I noticed after the race you were kind of talking him off the ledge because he wanted more than that. But still, all told, that was a great day for Mark. Yeah, we had a good day yesterday, and uh, we're expecting to have another good day today. You know, it's it's just building blocks. You know, we had a pole. We led some laps yesterday. Yeah, that was, that was really positive. I think we can take some things that we can keep building off of for today. Where's his confidence level right now, would you say? Yeah, Marco's confidence is good. You know, we've, we've been we've been really good early in the season. 
car's been good. We, you know, we keep getting better. The results are coming. Uh, so, you know, again, you know, we're just trying to execute on uh, on every single day and maximize out what the result on, on the given day. So, you know, qualifying didn't go exactly right for us there. We got a little bit of traffic when it counted today <clears throat> on the wet session, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, he's starting 12th, but we still have a very, very fast race car. We, we're planning on moving forward. Let's get back to it as the cars have now slowly made their way uh, back to pit road. That includes James Hinchcliffe. Uh, he leads this group right now. They're slowly making their way to pit lane before we get this restart underway here at Bella. And that crumpled pace car is on the flatbed and is going to the infield. And again, a replacement is on hand. And and uh, Oriole Serbia will be handling the pace car duties from this point forward. And uh, what makes this somewhat of a tedious process, Anders Grode, is the fact that the uh, AMR safety team, uh, they have the onboard starters, but uh, there's 23 cars to get started. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So they have to back up that uh, Chevy pickup truck to, to, to every single entry and uh, and get them refired. Yeah, so it is taking a bit of time, but they're, I, I want to say they're about through uh, roughly half the field now, so shouldn't be much longer. But, uh, you know, I was just thinking back to the only other time when I think I've ever seen an incident like that was in Toronto when there was torrential downpour and I forget who the pace car driver was but the Honda Civic at the time coming into the hairpin in turn three spun Ari it, Ari Leindijk yep. spun it and actually hit the barrier so it's it's not the only time it's it's happened because uh, he uh, almost hit the lift I was on yeah <laughs> well there you go you would know you would know that better than I would but yeah so so that's certainly the only other time I can remember well, there something like that happening tragedy but. involved in 1971 when Eldon Palmer was driving the pace car at the Indianapolis 500, and it got into a photographer's stand at the end of the uh, pit road. So, oh, wow. uh, that, uh, and I'm sure that uh, there are so many racetracks in America, large and small, short tracks, and you name it. There have been incidents involving the pace car, but let's. I, I guess if you want to put a positive spin on this, uh, uh, there's there's no doubt about the fact that the plenty of safety in that. It took a great hit, and those guys both walked away. Some big news this weekend involving McLaren and Dave First. You could tell us more about that. Yeah, an opportunity here to catch up. Zach Brown, who's the chief executive officer of McLaren. Uh, first things first, hey, you don't get this kind of stuff in, in Formula One now, you know. This is, what this, this, what, this is what makes it special. No, I haven't seen the safety car crashed in a while, but it has happened before. So actually, uh, now I hope everyone's uh, okay and we get racing here shortly. For you personally, a very important trip here this weekend. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, we're, uh, McLaren has a long history in uh, IndyCar, having won the uh, 500 three times as a manufacturer, twice as a team. We gave it a good go last year with uh, Michael and Fernando, which was a great experience. And so uh, as we continue to look at where McLaren should be racing, uh, IndyCar is uh, high on the radar. Is it safe to say it's going to happen within the next couple of years, or are you still in the exploratory stage, would you say? Uh, I think if it happens, it's going to happen sooner rather than uh, later. I think we've done a lot of exploring this weekend. I think we have a good uh, sense of what we want to do, and so it's not done till it's done, but uh, ho hopefully it could be as early as 2019. I was going to ask you, so 2019 might be the goal here. Uh, 2019, if we can get things put together here uh, quickly enough, uh, yeah, you, well, ho hopefully 19 it'll be. Did you like the feedback you got? I know you talked to folks from Chevrolet and Honda and various teams. What, what impressed you about some of those meetings? Uh, well, it's been most impressive is all the fans, uh, you know, getting a lot of hope to see McLaren here next year. So uh, uh, everyone's made us feel very welcome. I, of course, lived in Indianapolis for 20 years, so uh, lots of friends and family uh, out here. And uh, uh, I hope we can pull it off because it would be a great place to see McLaren race. I go back to last year's Indy 500 and the response that the fans had for Fernando Alonso and vice versa. I thought Alonso handled that, that month of May. I mean, you couldn't handle that better than he did, I think. Yeah, Fernando was great. He uh, he loved the experience. He uh, settled in really well, uh, worked real closely with Jill DeFerrin uh, as kind of his driver coach. Now, not that uh, Fernando needs much of a coaching, but uh, and then the whole uh, Andretti Autosport team did a, a great job. So it was a great experience, and that's why we think we want to uh, come, back for, uh, come back for some more. Would Alonzo be the driver for you here in IndyCar next year, or is it too early to say now? Uh, too, too early to say. We're not sure what he wants to do yet in uh, Formula 1. He's been doing that for 17 years. We certainly love to have him in any race car of ours. So uh, drivers is, is part of the consideration that we're working through now. All right. Wonderful to see you here. Will you be back later this season, or what are your plans at, at this point? I, uh, I hope so. On my uh, travel schedule, I tend to think about one week at a time. So uh, uh, I, I definitely do have another IndyCar race on my uh, in my iPhone. 
Great to have you here. Look forward to seeing you once again later this season. Thank you very much. Right. Zach Brown, again, the exe Chief Executive Officer at McLaren. And, boy, guys, sounds like some good news for McLaren and the Verizon IndyCar Series come 2019. Pretty sizable development, Anders. Oh, that, that would be brilliant. And, and, and I'll tell you what, I, I know he's got to keep his, uh, his lips sealed about their plans, but I would love nothing more than to see Fernando Alonso in the Verizon IndyCar Series next year because I think... Probably part of what he's missed in Formula One over the last few years is the fact that he knows that if he's not at the moment in a, in a Ferrari or Mercedes or a Red Bull, he won't have a chance to win races in the championship. I think he realizes if he comes to the Verizon IndyCar Series, just about any team on the grid here you can win with because that's what IndyCar has done such a great job of with the Universal Aero Kit, with tightening the regulations so much so that it really comes down to your driver, your engineering, and, and obviously the, the way the team is structured from, from a strategy perspective. But I think I think he realizes and, and he can probably smell the fact that if he came in here, he knows it would be a lot more on his shoulders to deliver the results than he currently is in, in uh, F1. We will stay abreast of the situation for sure as this season progresses. And as you heard Zach Brown say, we'll, we will probably see him yet again. Uh, all of the cars by the AMR safety team have been returned to pit road. We hope to get this race started very, very soon. We pause 10 seconds for station identification. This is the Advanced Auto Parts IndyCar Radio Network. When the IMS Radio Network needs to hear every word in one of the loudest environments in sports. Ryan Hunter Ray, why the crew's on the touch of The IMS Radio Network depends on racing electronics. He just called his team and said, guys, this race car is unbelievable. When you're at the track and you want to hear what the pros hear, use what the pros use. Racing electronics, scanners, headsets, and more. Online at racingelectronics.com or stop by the Racing Electronics trailer when you get to the track. This is NHRA Funny Car Driver, Courtney Force. Time to head to Advance Auto Parts for low prices and tons of free services. We offer free battery, starter, and alternator testing and free battery installation with purchase. Plus, Speed Perks members earn up to $20 in rewards. Don't miss out. Visit an Advance or participating CarQuest Auto Parts store near you today. Advance Auto Parts. Let's get you back on the road. From the streets of Belle Isle, this is the Advance Auto Parts IndyCar Radio Network. If you are struggling to pay or haven't been making your student loan payments, listen carefully to this urgent alert. Have you been out of school for 10 or more years and you're still making your student loan payments? Are your student loans past due or even in default? Can't go back to school because of an old student loan problem? We can help you if you qualify. Your student loans can be taken out of default. We can stop the wage garnishments, stop the collection calls, and stop the seizure of your tax refund. Give yourself a break. Stop the stress and see if we can help you reduce your student loan payments. One quick 10-minute call could solve them right now. So call the Student Loan Helpline now. 877-806-0387-877-806-0387-877-806-0387-877-806-0387 This is a fee-based document preparation service to help you access free government programs. Call for complete details not available in all states. From the Firestone Broadcast booth at Belle Isle, this is the Verizon IndyCar Series. Uh, actually, he was so descriptive, he gave us an idea of what led to that incident involving the pace car. Talking about Graham Rahal, we need to thank him for his course description. And today's race course description is brought to you by Twisted Tea Hard Iced Tea, made with real brewed iced tea and 5% alcohol by volume. Twist for your next tailgate. It, it, we talked to some of the team principals. I, this got to be a little difficult for drivers. I mean, you, you you get yourself all geared up and ready for the start, and then uh, you just you got to be patient. Yeah, and, and again, just kind of go back to the point about how much these cars heat soak and just how warm these drivers are inside the cockpit now. They're used to 
coming straight from driver intros, bit of air circulation, and then they get strapped into the cars, and then it's only a couple of minutes until they take off. But now they've been in the cars for 15, 20 minutes with no air circulation whatsoever, no movement. So uh, everyone here is going to be uh, ready to go for sure. Uh, Rene Bender, his car did not restart, had to be quick jacked back to pit road. It's now reported back to its pit box. So, uh, Ryan Marine, you have an update on that. I do. The car is not back at the pit box yet. I talked to Ricardo Juncos and asked him what the situation was. He said the car did start initially. It was out there on the pace laps when all the craziness unfolded. But when they tried to restart it a few moments ago, it would not. And now they're being told they can't do anything to the race car because it's under red flag conditions. Conditions. They're trying to see if this might be special circumstances, force majeure, I think is how it's termed. Um, at the moment, they don't have a good answer for that, so they're not exactly sure what the issue is going to be for the Austrian Rene Bender and that Hunkos racing car. Uh, but uh, at the moment, that, that uh, the team is certainly concerned. They'd, they'd like to try and get to the bottom of this if possible. Michael Young. We're with the Verizon IndyCar Series pace car driver, Oriol Servia, and obviously uh, a, a good run in Indianapolis, by the way. Well done there. But uh, back to the pace car, obviously this is a unique situation, but one that I don't think can be, I don't know, find it being too odd because it's not that easy driving these things around, especially on a street circuit. Well, listen, you know, this is a street race, um, and it's not a normal racetrack, especially here in Detroit. It's all concrete which makes it very slippery and bumpy. Um, so it, it, is, it is challenging. I was telling people yesterday, you know, it's, you, you have to be on it uh, because also you're trying to go fast. It's still slow for the Indy cars behind me, but for, for the actual uh, normal car, it's fast. So it's, um, it's not easy. And uh, you know, it's a shame that Mark Reus, you know, uh, president of GM was driving. He's, he's a top guy and knows how to drive really well. But I think maybe just a bump caught him off guard or something. You know, it's uh, it's not it's not easy. And I but I feel bad for for all of them. It's a great car. I love the car. It's, uh, you know, but it's um, it's tough when you're trying to drive this fast. Talk about that difficulty coming out of turn two. What it's like. I, I think it's difficult for people driving in city streets to understand what's going on at that speed. Yeah, it's a fast chicane and it has a little race on top. It's kind of a blind corner and it has a lot of bumps. So sometimes, you know, the car wants to uh, go places you don't want it to go. But um, again, it's just it's just a tough situation. I feel really bad. But but trust me, people at home, it's not as easy as it looks from from your couches. Um, but um, I'm I hope I hope he's all right, and uh, and and both him and Mark Sandy, who usually drives on my right, I hope he's also fine. Obviously, we will see you later on this afternoon. Thank you for all your right. time. Thank you, Rising Indy Car Series pace car driver Oriel Servia, and that boy, that is a costly, costly incident for that beautiful pace car. That's a solid pickup, Michael Young. Well done in securing uh, the comments of Oriel Servia, and again, Mark uh, Royce, uh, product development, uh, global product development for GM. You heard Oriel Servia say that. Uh, uh, Mark Royce has a bit of experience in doing such things, and of course he's been our guest for a couple of years on the night for the Pagoda for the Indianapolis 500, and uh, the, the crews, Anders, have been released out to their cars, giving them a last-minute look-see before we get things restarted. Yeah, and, and the key here is just to get the, the car up on the quick jack and rotate the tires to make sure there's no, uh, there's no cuts or anything, because obviously all of them had to go through the debris field created by the pace car, so the key here is just go through the tires, make sure there's nothing Nothing, uh, nothing uh, come into the tire there, and, and if that is the case, they'll alert IndyCar and, and see if IndyCar won't let them uh, put an alternate tire on. Back to Michael Young. Just down here on pit lane, guys, just to uh, reiterate what Andrew said, they're really looking over these Firestone Firehawks, and indeed, with all that debris from that pace car incident, standing looking at the guys for a Robert Rickens crew, and they just found a slight cut in one of the right rear tire, or the right rear tire, so just trying to make sure that there's no problems, but the, the crews are just combing over each and every one of these tires just to make sure there's no incidents once we do go green flag racing. Man, so, as, as you mentioned, that's the biggest concern. Yeah, and uh, I guess, Michael Young, is there any way you can grab someone from IndyCar to see if they would actually let someone replace a, uh, a tire if, if there is indeed a cut or is that something that the, the drivers and teams just have to contend with? So, uh, again, we are in a holding pattern because of an incident involving the pace car just shortly after uh, the cars had exited pit road and uh, the only car that, that we think we might have an issue with uh, as we get restarted would be the uh, 32 machine of Renee Bender. You heard Ryan Marine report on that moments ago. And uh, 
Uh, Anders, I, I, I think now when we start to get into that uh, time period where we wonder, that it, it, is time going to start being of the essence? I mean, we're scheduled for 70 laps here, 164.5 miles, but, uh, uh, boy, this, this thing should have green flagged by now. Yeah, and uh, yeah, you, you just kind of question, it's already a sprint race at 70 laps, so certainly if they cut that down to, to become a timed race, then it'll almost certainly be a two-stopper for every single uh, driver and team involved, and that'll make it into just all-out sprint, and I'm, I'm actually quite looking forward to it, because I think it's going to be crazy. Uh, Alexander Rossi was the only driver, by the way, to clear the wreckage, and again, we're happy to report both uh, Mark Royce and the IndyCar official in the pace car were able to, to step out and walk away under their own power. But again, a, a testament to the safety because uh, he had to scrub nut speed off of that when those rear wheels broke loose and sent him headlong into the wall. He must have been doing 70, 80 miles an hour with no helmet or anything uh, on, on like that. And I could actually see the, the side perspective of, of the car as it hit the barrier. And it was a really, really big hit. So, uh, yeah, exactly to your point, uh, good thing that the, that the front hood there on that Corvette is about eight miles long, or at least it appears to be. And that's uh, probably a good thing for the crash structure. So, uh, Alexander Rossi, Robert Wickens will start on the front row again. Uh, will Power and Ed Jones make up row number two? And then uh, Dixon and Hinchcliffe, row number three. And row number four, Veach and Pagino. Row number five will be Graham Rahal and Ryan Hunter Ray. Uh, then Jordan King and Marco Andretti in row six. Row seven will be Santino Ferrucci and Gabby Chavez. Row number eight, Spencer Pickett, Sebastian Bourdais in row nine. Uh, Max Chilton, Mateus Laced in row number 10, Joseph Newgarden, Takuma Sato in row number 11, Charlie Kimball and Tony Ganon. And then completing the field of 23, Renee Bender. We hope to have an update for you in terms of when we go green when we come back to Belle Isle. Firestone presents legendary drives, super speedways, short ovals, dry tracks, wet tracks, concrete or asphalt. The IndyCar Series is the ultimate test for a driver. And being a driver that can adapt to anything means having a tire that can do the same. That's why we build Firestone tires to handle it all. Because if they can endure all that, well, you can bet they'll bring you to victory every day. Whatever you drive, drive a Firestone, the tire that drives IndyCar legends. Geico presents unhelpful home improvement how-tos. Nothing's worse than walking into your garage and realizing a thief has ridden off with your bike. So today, I'll teach you how to burglar-proof your home with a pudding-filled moat. All you need is a backhoe, a drawbridge, and thousands of gallons of butterscotch pudding. Now let's start digging. You could try to protect your stuff with pudding, or you could get covered for personal property loss through the Geico Insurance Agency. Call Geico and see how affordable homeowners insurance can be. From the streets of Belle Isle, this is the Advance Auto Parts IndyCar Radio Network. What's it like to drive an Indy car at the famed Indianapolis Motor Speedway? Now the Indy Racing Experience can put you in the driver's seat. That's right. You can drive an Indy car at the world's greatest race course. Packages started under $500. But hurry, sessions are selling out fast. Call 888-357-5002 or go online to IndyRacingExperience.com. You driving a real Indy car. Call 888-357-5002 now. Catch the excitement and relive your favorite memories of IndyCar racing. Yoda Farron winds up second, and it looks like we might see a donut or two as the 68. No, he's going to get out on the front straight. Let's see what happens with the 68. He's going to climb, gonna climb, the, climb fence. the fence. He is out of the car, and Elio Castro Neves climbs the fence in the front straight. 24 hours a day, seven days a week on IndyCarRadio.com. Or download the TuneIn app to your phone or tablet and take us with you. From the Firestone Broadcast booth at Belle Isle, this is the Verizon IndyCar Series. All right, here is where we stand. It's going to take some time to get the transponder in the pace car. IndyCar officials taking care of that. Uh, they'll be given a three-minute after that, three minutes to go after that. And by the way, we speculated as to whether or not this would be a timed race. We can tell you now this race is going to run to its completion, 70 laps. So that's uh, all that we know. So that's all that you know uh, for now. Uh, let's go to Pit Road. Firestone this weekend unveiling a new rain tire. And the pace car is ready as we speak. So that three-minute clock begins. But Michael Young 
Doesn't look like they're going to use it uh, for race purposes, but it got a pretty good workout during qualifying today. Boy, they certainly did with those wet tires and the Firestones looking fantastic thus far. Chief engineer of Firestone Racing, Kara Adams, joins us. We'll talk quickly about the wets. And I thoughts on those? I think of a very successful debut. Yeah, it was really great for us to get feedback so early. Usually when we launch a rain tire, it waits about a, a year or maybe even two years before it rains next. So it was really great for us to get that feedback early. The pattern looked great out there, so we got some good feedback from the people up at the front of the field and people behind in the field, so it was good. I thought it was odd because they were smoking when they come off. It was so hot. It's amazing when you see these tires up close, what they're able to do in the wet. Yeah, the, the, it's wet and in drying conditions because it was pretty damp out there by the time we were done. This is really great because we had some of the past tire engineers that helped develop the tread pattern actually out at the track with us this weekend so to see those performance of the tires was pretty great for them so everybody on alternate tires with the exception of Mateus laced and they of course called you to the ready hey look at these tires because there were several concerns with the debris that the pace car caused. Yeah, all these cars actually had new tires. Mateus Laced had the new primary. Everybody else had new alternates. And I just went out there and I looked at a few cars. There are about five cars that we looked at that had really minor nicks in it. So we looked at make sure they were safe to run. Very good. Have a great race. I right, thank you, Michael. Let's go to day first. Here with Kyle Moyer, of course, uh, helps call the shots for Simon Pash. You know, what, what was your greatest concern when you heard about all this? Are your tires okay? Uh, tires are fine and everything. I mean, the if everybody stopped and it wasn't too bad they got it cleaned up before we got pushed around i guess my biggest concerns with the pace car driver i mean that was a pretty big hit but uh you know we'll get going here and everything like that the sun's popped out now so track's warming up so it should be good when you, when you start the car you stop it i mean you gotta worry about temps here and there and i mean or, or do you not worry about it think you think you're good to go when you restart things yeah, no, we'll be good to go. Our biggest thing is just trying to keep our driver awake and everything like that because he wants to go to sleep right now and because he's kind of bored. But uh, and here in a couple of laps will be definitely fun. All right. A difficult day for you guys yesterday. But you're starting further up here today. What do you, what do you have maybe for the rest of the field? <laughs> to be honest, Dave, I don't know. We, we did a wholesale change last night. And, you know, it seemed to be good in the rain this morning. So uh, hopefully it'll be good in the dry. We'll be watching. Get back to it. Thanks for your time. Kyle Moyer again helps call the shots for Simon Pagino, who will restart eighth here this afternoon. He said yesterday after qualifying that their car just simply didn't like bumps. This ain't the best place to be when you don't like bumps. No, exactly. And, and we've kind of documented over the course of the weekend just how different these uh, these different teams' drivers are handling the overall setup. And, and typically when you come to a bumpy place like this, you'll soften up the car tremendously. And certainly we've seen that both on the Andretti Autosport cars in particular, as well as Schmidt Peterson Motorsports. Very, very soft, softly sprung car. Scott Dixon, however, in quality qualifying yesterday somehow able to run what appeared to be a super super stiff car so he, he somehow was able to make that work but certainly i can imagine that that penske probably looked at that and said uh, our, our safe bet here is to go softer with the car overall if you're struggling for grip on a bumpy track like this on the concrete typically going softer will help you just gain a little bit more compliance or all the bumps help help the help the tire connect and uh, and um, uh, just gain a little bit more grip uh, hats off to you hardy race fans here on bell isle in detroit give yourselves a round of applause for sure because uh, the engines uh, have refired now your patience uh, has been rewarded uh, not so much so for the 32 of renee bender a crew working on the car during an unapproved period he will have to set for the first two laps of this race. It's kind of been a struggle out of the box for Renee Bender and uh, that race team this weekend. Yeah, and obviously they opted to sit out qualifying this morning, hoping to just have a clean run of the race today. And, and it's just a it's a gut punch to already be two laps down by the time you take the by the time you take the green flag. So sh shame for him. But I, I really think he needs to look at this as a learning experience with with Hunko's racing. He uh, obviously was was quite a ways off the pace in St. Pete when he made his IndyCar debut, and I think. He just really needs to work on his outright pace. We, we heard from Ricardo Juncos yesterday after the race. He said that he set the 15th fastest race lap yesterday. So if he can improve upon that today, I think that'll be a good day for them, regardless of being two laps or three laps or even ten laps down. And Ryan Marine, they had to quick jack the car all the way back to the pit box. They couldn't get it restarted after they had removed the debris and the pace car from that incident. And uh, he has to set for the first two laps, as we said, but you're happy to report that they did at least get that car refired eventually. 
That's correct. They did get the cowling off that car, went to work on it under what was termed a red flag condition, which is interesting because there was never a, uh, a uh, green flag. But nonetheless, they did go to work and they did get that engine refired. I'm going to try and get a little bit of clarification as to whether or not they were expecting the penalty to come uh, because they were in communication with IndyCar officials throughout the whole process. But you're right. The good news ultimately is that the engine did fire. They are going to be out on track just a little bit delayed. Turn announcers have been waiting patiently as well. Jake Query, you have race cars coming by you. Back of the field, as a matter of fact, one thing I noticed, Mateus Lace, that young Brazilian in that car number four for A.J. Foyt, ABC Supply Racing, Mark James, he is the only who has decided to go on the primary black tires, not the softer compound red tires to start out this delayed, but yet about to begin race. Uh, Nick Yeoman, let's keep all four tires on the ground down at turn number seven today, shall Boy, we? what a uh, bizarre 24 hours, and what a bizarre day it's been so far, Mark James. I'm reminded of that James Taylor song about seeing fire and rain and sunny days you never thought would end and then of course I never thought I'd see the pace car crash but thankfully all engines fired everybody clear at turn seven as we are moments away from finally going racing here in Detroit does my heart good to hear you reference a song that's older than you are well done Nick Gilman Alexander Rossi as we mentioned is B1 Robert Wickens Will Power Ed Jones Scott Dixon Hitch Feech Pagino Ray Hall Ryan Hunter Ray the top ten Finally, Anders Krohn's time to go racing. Going to be interesting. You think there's anybody at all that's going to bail on the strategy of the two-stop or the three-stop, and they're going to stick with, with the, what the plan is right now? It doesn't depend on if we get any cautions. Well, I, I think now that we've uh, officially committed to, to a 70-lap race, yeah, I, I think everyone's going to stay, at least for the time being, on, on their uh, sort of preferred strategy. However, if it becomes a caution-filled race, then things can change really, really quickly, and it can either help or hurt someone's strategy. So, uh, that's just it, and uh, so far this season, as you referenced earlier, it's been a season of unpredictability, and, and I think we have more in store of that today. Any racing groove that was laid down throughout Friday and Saturday because of the rain last night and this morning, is it all gone? Uh, well, I don't know that it's all gone, but certainly the, the top uh, and, and the best part of the rubber would have been removed, not, not just because of the rain, but also because of the fact that the stadium super trucks drove on the track just before this race, so they would have collected that all that rubber and, and taken that off the surface. So it's going to be uh, a, a few laps here of just laying down more rubber. Top five finishes for Alexander Rossi through this race day his worst finish 11th other than that all top fives this championship rewards consistency and he's shown that through the first quarter of the season and, and you know you, you just look at the the performance that he had at barber even though he finished 11th there still he would have easily been in contention for a top five had he not had a late race the uh, off track excursion so i think he's got that mindset and, and kind of you look at his his whole attitude and just see just see he has that killer instinct and just he'll do anything that it takes to improve his position on track Back and, and in the championship and we certainly saw that yesterday when he did that outside move around the outside Marco Andretti and actually squeezed Marco up onto the up onto the curb in turn three so Alexander Rossi certainly willing to do everything uh, good news is we are going to go double file on the start because we really never got started so we're waiting for the green flag to come out as the field comes into formation with Alexander Rossi and Robert Wickens and it looks like Rossi is going to gain the advantage and Wickens is going to grab that second spot. We see Ed Jones trying to slip in front of Will Power. They go side by side into turn number one and I think that Ed Jones is going to grab that spot. Indeed he will. Others like James Hinchcliffe trying to keep pace with that pack. Oddly enough, Rossi and Wickens separating themselves. They're taking a very high line as they're attempting to go three wide into turn number three. So, a battle for the third spot between Will Power and Ed Jones. Meanwhile, Alexander Rossi all alone, P1. Rossi and Wickens already into turn six, then about a 10 car length gap back. Then Will Power, Ed Jones, Scott Dixon, James Hitchcliffe, Graham Rahal, and Zach Beach. Joseph Newgarden getting racy about midway pack. And as the leaders make their way through turn number seven for the first time, our attention will turn to the back of the field. Jake, you see some issues in turn five. Exiting turn number five, Spencer Pickett got spun around. That brings out a full course caution. Looked like he was going to be able to perhaps get that engine fired back up. But the right side of that machine is against 
the wall at the exit of turn number five. This happened about mid-pack back. Spencer Pickett at that Fuzzy's Ultra Premium Vodka machine, of course, and he is sitting right now and awaiting for somebody to get him spun around in the right direction. Not a good start for Spencer Pickett. And Nick Yeoman, you see a, an issue for Sebastian Bourdais. Yeah, obviously from turn seven, I couldn't see what happened, but I can certainly say Sebastian Bourdais got hit because he has a flat left rear tire, and that car should be headed to pit lane momentarily. Uh, Spencer Pickett with a 10th place finish yesterday. We saw the replay, Anders. Good news is didn't appear to be much in the way of contact. No, not at all, but just looked like he tried to get on the power there and, and just spun it around. And, and again, we've we've kind of heard over the course of the weekend just how much of that Chevy power is delivered so instantly here. When you have cold tires, very, very easy to spin the car around. So unfortunate there for, for Spencer Piggott, who's had a, a tough start to the season, to, to say the least, and he really needed a good run here today. And I'm trying to look at the car here of Spencer Piggott. It, it does appear to be tracking a little bit strangely. Uh, Sebastian Bourdais is on pit road. Michael Young is there. Yeah, that left rear is completely done. Talked about maybe changing that front wing. They're keeping an eye on it. No fuel. Taking their time putting those blacks on. No other damage to that car. They were concerned there was contact. That was a reason for that left rear going down, but no other damage, like I said. So Sebastian Bourdais down and away. Yeah, we don't see much of the way of damage on that car. Did you get another peek at Spencer Pickett's car? I, I did not. know. It, it, it looks like everything's fine here as he's trying to catch up to the back of the pack, but now suddenly I've got harrowing memories to what Sebastian Bourdais did at, Gr at the Grand Prix of St. Petersburg last year, and that was come from the back to the front. And keep in mind, Sebastian Bourdais started on the on the Firestone Reds. He's now gone on to the Firestone Black, so he can now play the alternate strategy all throughout the course of this race. So he's already off sequence. And we know Dale Coyne Racing and Vassar Sullivan have played some, played some blinders before, so don't count out Sebastian Bourdais yet. On the start, Ed Jones got a little racing, Anders. It looked like he was going to pick up a couple of spots, even at third momentarily. But uh, now as we see them run, Power, Dixon, Hitch, all able to get their way around Ed Jones. Yeah, and Ed Jones had a great move around the outside of Will Power in turn one, but then lost a bit of momentum in turn six, just ran a bit wide over that crest that, uh, that, that's that been talked about so much over the course of this weekend, just how difficult it is. Ran a bit wide, and that, uh, that fell him back a couple of spots. But uh, certainly uh, lots of time to make up for that. Fred Jones. Uh, Pit Road and day first. Uh, they think there is a suspension issue for the number 21 Fuzzy's Vodka Machine. Uh, Spencer Pickett, they got a couple parts out, got a wishbone out just in case, but uh, they want to get a good look-see once the 21 is brought back to pit lane, whether or not there is some damage. If that's the case, then this is going to be a lengthy pit stop, boys. Yeah, we are seeing a couple of cars at the rear of the field. Ryan Marine, you're into pit road getting busy during this caution. Charlie Kimball is in. They're bolting the black primary tires onto that car. We also saw Santito Ferrucci in for Dale Coyne Racing. So a couple of the cars towards the back of the pack electing to go on an alternate strategy. Now, during the, the time the pits were closed, Michael Young, Sebastian Bourdais was able to come in, but uh, couldn't do much to the car. He's back now, though. Indeed, he changed the uh, left rear. They put a brand new set of Firestone Blacks on that car. They ran one lap, so they scuffed those tires. They came back in, filled them full of fuel, and put on four new Firestone Blacks. So they've got a scuff set ready to roll once they go to that later on in the race. We, Let's go down the oh, sorry, Dave. we mentioned the crew for Renee Bender worked on the car in an unapproved time period. That parked him for two laps. He has now been released. Let's go to day first. Max Chilton also taking advantage of that yellow. He came in, threw on a sticker set of black tires. Here now with the 21 of a Spencer Piggott as they've topped him off. They're looking at, well, they're taking a good hard look at every suspension piece there is. Left, right, rear, and so forth. And yet there's a little damage on that left rear suspension. Although, well, they let him go. So maybe not so. Spencer Piggott down and away. Anders. Yeah, I, I almost wonder if they if they decided to send him there to make sure he didn't lose a lap. So I don't know if uh, if they are indeed going to do one more lap here. Caution, they may very well send him, let him catch up to the back of the pack, and then pit him again because it did look like that car was tracking just a little bit straight, almost like it had just kinked the left or right rear uh, rear tire, and uh, and that it's maybe just tracking a bit uh, down the straight, and, and certainly don't want that on a on a street uh, street course like this. It's amazing uh, to me, quite quite frankly, and how, how durable uh, these suspension pieces are on these cars, but yet sometimes they seem so very, very frail, so very, very fragile. We just saw him off of turn number four, and that something did not look right with the rear of that race. Yeah, no, not, not at all, actually, and uh, 
uh, obviously it's designed to break when you hit the wall and that's to absorb the impact so that uh, all the force doesn't get put back into the driver so uh, everything all the corners on, on, on the on the car are designed as crumple zones so that when you get into the wall they are designed to crumple uh, to kind of absorb all that energy so so they are doing their task but for the most part I mean we've seen some serious wheel banging over the course of the last few events and uh, these cars hold up extremely well. Uh, Bourdais has to go to the back because they did some work on that car changing that left rear in a closed pit and we're getting ready to go back green and then the, the Dave first reports to us that uh, Spencer Pickett is indeed coming back to pit road and Dave you're more specific about what the damage is to that car now. Yeah a little left rear tie rod issue for these guys so uh, next time by they expect to see the 21 back on pit road. Is that a terminal situation something they can fix on pit road? They, they should definitely yeah. be able to fix it but, but he'll go more than one lap time uh, down presumably and, and, and the tie rod uh, it controls the, the, the toe of the car and it's so so critical just a millimeter or an eighth of an inch of a difference uh, or, or, or a, a 32nd of an inch or, or whatever that is makes a huge difference to the overall toe of the car so it's certainly a big impact we just got a peek at the replay and about nine cars missed him by just a matter of a few uh, small inches I mean that that could have been a massive pileup but uh, they were able to avoid that as the crew continues to go to work on the car of Spencer Pickett he will see and hear the field roar by him as the green flag is waved and a great jump by Alexander Rossi he leads Wickens into turn number one Power Dixon hits lift the top five Jones Ray Hall Beach Marco Andretti and Pagino the top ten the entire 22 car field still on the racetrack is single file now at the setup of turn number three. About halfway back, Ryan Hunter Ray jumps out of line, quickly jumps back into line. So Alexander Rossi will lead the field off of turn number five. And just like that, they pop into the view of Jay Query. Rossi has a pretty comfortable advantage, as a matter of fact, in through turn number six. Then Wickens and Will Power. Everybody now a little more conservative in single file, except for Tony Kanan, who made a move around to Kumasato. But the leader's already well in Nick Yeoman's view. Boy, Alexander Rossi got a massive jump as he's got about an eight car length advantage over the six car of Robert Wickens. A little bit further back, they're stacking up. Tony Kanan, he'll look to the inside and go wheel to wheel with Joseph Newgarden through turn seven. Newgarden holds him off through turn number eight. You didn't go to any of the casinos with the odds, but uh, you do feel like, did feel like coming into this race, this would be a good day for Alexander Ross. Yeah, I did indeed, and uh, we, we saw this in Long Beach when he had the pole position and, and he had a clean start and, and clean restarts. He just ran away with things, and the gap that he's opened on the first lap here is just ginormous. 1.6 seconds in one lap here as Ryan Hunter Ray down the inside of Simon Fashion. A huge move. Yeah, good, good move into turn number one for Ryan Hunter Ray. He knew he would have a fast race car, and that is the 10th position. He was able to wrestle it away. Incident between the 21 and the 19 was given a look-see, and the race control determined that no cause for any further action. Ryan Hunter Ray now trying to catch Marco Andretti. Pagino, meanwhile, is uh, under attack by Mateus Lace. They head to Jay Query. Another good battle is Marco Andretti, the battle for seventh. He is all over Zach Beach. Then behind him, it is Ryan Hunter Ray, the leader, set sail for turn number seven. Let's pick up that battle for seventh as Marco Andretti stalks his teammate Zach Beach down to the right hander of turn number seven. He closes it within about a car length, trying to get into the corner, but not able to get alongside. Beach will hold him off on this lap. Beach pretty happy with his run yesterday, all in all, Anders. Yeah, and it was just a clean momentum builder of a weekend, and then a very, very positive qualifying session this morning, qualifying seventh, I believe, for uh, for Zach Beach. So, yeah, very, very good uh, good day so far, and a good weekend for, for Zach. I, I think Andretti Autosport as a whole unloaded in pretty good shape this weekend. I mean, I know they didn't get the win, but I mean, the pole, and, and you know, they've had Rossi be fairly dominant. Ryan Hunter Race had a good weekend as well. And it just looks like their street course game has just gotten better and better 
been better ever since they finally broke through in Toronto last year to a good result. It, it looks like they've just gone from strength to strength to strength. And I really think Alexander Rossi deserves a lot of credit for that because uh, he certainly helped elevate the, the team's overall performance in, in that arena. A two-second lead for Alexander Rossi to Jake Query in turn six. Yep. As a matter of fact, he approaches turn six as Wickens pops out of turn number five. Then it's Will Power, Scott Dixon, and James Hitchcliffe, followed by Ed Jones, Graham Ray Hall, Zach Beach, Marco and Ready, and Ryan Hunter Ray. Alexander Rossi makes his way down to turn seven, in command by about ten car lengths. Then you've got Wickens running in second, Power comfortably for third. Now we're going side by side for seven. Boy, and Marco Andretti went to the outside of Zach Beach. They nearly made contact. Beach had to lift at the last second, and Marco took the spot. You did a double take, Anders, when you saw that. Wow, well, there's no love lost between the two of those Andretti Autosport teammates. Man, it was like Marco Andretti said, well, Alexander Rossi did it to me yesterday, so now I'm going to do it to Zach Beach, and he was very aggressive. That was actually a beautiful move, though. Just squeezed Zach Beach into the inside curbing and, and forced him to really get out of the throttle or else there would have been an incident. So, my, oh my, that is an aggressive Marco Andretti. I, I like it. That is the battle for the eighth position. Now, Ryan Hunter Ray starts to draw a bead on his teammate. The 28 chasing the 26. Rossi continues to pull away. Wickens has some breathing room, but now Scott Dixon is starting to feel some pressure from James Hinscliffe, among others, as the leaders head back to Jake Query in turn number six. Scott Dixon, that is the battle for fourth with James Hinscliffe right behind him. Will Power in the third spot. Nick Yeoman, it looks like actually Dixon might be gaining on power for spot number three. I think that's a good eye, Jay Query. It's about three car lengths as they make their way down to turn seven. Uh, running in that fifth spot, watching both of those drivers is the mayor Hinchdown, James Hinchcliffe. It's still stock power, and then Dixon through turn number eight. A good battle for third. Uh, you really got to have your wits about you as you head down that long back straightaway, Anders. Turn seven gets on you in a hurry. And it's just so easy also if you get trapped in kind of the, the push to pass territory and you push that button and then you get so locked locked in on the car ahead of you on their gearbox and suddenly you realize, oh man, I'm coming up on the brake zone here, so very, very easy to make a mistake or outbreak yourself. And also, when you ride on the gearbox of someone, you get all that turbulent air that uh, that certainly makes the braking even more difficult. Yeah, we call it a back straight, but it's a bit of a mis misnomer because it does have a bend in it, and that bend is one of the things that makes seven appear so quickly. Well, yeah, it's more like a back S, I guess you could call it, as they have to snake their way down the back straightaway. But Ryan Hunter right now with a great run down towards turn three on the brakes. Let's see, is Zach Veach going to squeeze or give him room? A lot of room there given by Zach Veach and Ryan hunter -Ray. Doesn't uh, doesn't want to tap into him, that's for sure. That battle continues now between Veach and hunter Ray And Jake, that's the battle for the ninth position. Yep, right now it is being held by Zach Veach, but Ryan hunter Ray is right there. Simon Pagino is going to try to get a peek on it, but those two clearly than the 22. Beach with a little bit of an advantage now exiting six. Yeah, here comes Beach making his way to turn number seven. Ryan hunter Ray closest to within a car length with Simon Pagano, Mateus Lace, Jordan King all in tow. Everyone trying to get around Zach Beach. Yep, Zach Beach has him stacked up behind him, no doubt about it. Looking a little farther back up in front of him, a little farther in front of him. Power, Dixon, Hinchcliffe. That's starting to heat up a little bit. Ray Hall's in the middle of that mess too. And let's see what we have here. Will Power still able to hang on in, in third spot there, and uh, that's a pretty solid uh, comeback there for the, for the Team Chevy after a rough day yesterday. But now big pressure here from behind for Ryan hunter Ray with Simon Pagino. And oh, Ryan hunter Ray runs wide! Hunter Ray does run wide, but he's not going to lose a position to Simon Pagino, at least not yet. Pagino trying to get the runoff of it down what is essentially the long front straightaway, heading into that 2-3 complex. Pit window starting to open up. Ryan Hunter Ray, though, with a whole bunch of cars stacked up behind him, Jake Query. He'll come into your view momentarily. It is so hard to believe that it's now been a 40-plus race drought for Ryan Hunter Ray, who now all of a sudden behind him sees He's Mateus Lace getting racy with Simon Pagino. That allows Hunter Lay Ray a little bit of distance. Call it eight car lengths back before he gets to that 10th spot. Change for the fifth position as Ed Jones just got around James Hinchcliffe in turn number seven. So move Jones into the top five, and now Hinchcliffe has got his hands full with Graham Ray Hall. To pit road in day first. Already a couple of takers on pit road. That includes Tony Kanaan, the one-time champion here at Detroit. Takuma Sato, both going to sticker blacks here this afternoon. And uh, as we 
we speak will power the only Chevrolet in the top 10, so Honda's dominance continues today. Yeah, it does indeed, but uh, but still pace-wise, the fact that he's able to run within eight tenths now of Robert Wickens is actually not a bad day. As Ryan Hunter Ray is on the pit lane. He is not happy with the Firestone Reds. So Ryan Hunter Ray makes that long haul down pit road, and they'll come into the view of day first. Yep, Ryan Hunter Ray, second yesterday, was on the radio imploring a pit stop. So the Reds are really going away very quickly. Nice stop, 7.4 for Ryan Hunter Ray. James Hinchcliffe with his first stop, complaining about the left front. They took it off, and it looked like it on all kinds of debris on it. Joseph Newgarden also coming in. He'll go to the Firestone Blacks. How about Simon Pagino and Mateus Laced? That is a pretty good battle, Jake Query. It comes to you at turn number six, the battle for ninth. Rookie looking hard on the former champion, Simon Pagino right now with the spot. They exit turn number six. Pagino went a little bit low, laced right in the tire tracks. Boy, big lock up by Zach Veach down here at turn seven. Now we see that battle as Pagino holds off laced. Further back, a couple Dale Coyne racing teammates battling as Sebastian Bourdais goes to the outside of his American teammate Santino Ferrucci to pick up a spot. How about Alexander Rossi with a lead of 4.2 seconds? Just unreal, and when everyone else is starting to fade on the Firestone Reds. He's still doing lap times of a 1.18.9 on that last lap, and now a 1.19.2, so still just keeping up the pace here, and I think all he needs to do now is another four or five laps here to get himself in that two-stop window, and then he'll be in good position, so his strategist just got to make sure to not get caught up by a full-course yellow. Uh, Robert Wickens holding on to the top ten, but he wants to come to pit road, Michael Young. Yes, indeed, for his first stop of the afternoon. They will put a full round into that front wing. That's a great stop. Six Six seconds for Robert Wicken. Uh, Jake Query put a good battle for second shaping up. Power, Dixon, Jones, Ray Hall, they're all involved. And Alexander Rossi has already cleared turn six. Then Power has a little bit of comfort, but right behind him, Dixon, Jones, and then Ray Hall is right there as well. Three-car freight train coming at you, Nick Yeoman. The lead for Rossi is massive. Here comes that three-car freight train. A good battle. Looks like it's going to be for third. As Scott Dixon's going to have to hold off his teammate, Ed Jones. Tell you what, Mark James, Ed Jones looking pretty racy as he closes to within a car length of yesterday's winner. But we are now officially in the day danger zone here for Alexander Rossi as the battle keeps heating up here. Santino Ferrucci, Gabby Chavez, Max Chilton, and Charlie Kimball all fighting tooth and nail, and this is so dangerous here for Alexander Rossi. If a full course caution comes out, he's going to be caught out. So, uh, yeah, betcha that the strategist there, Rob Edwards, is going to be thinking overtime. What do we have to do here? Do we have to pit him here slightly outside the window, or do we roll the dice and keep him out? Man, Bourdais is wearing out the 20 of Jordan King. I mean, they're, they're working their way around uh, the, the, that main straightaway now, setting up for turn number one, and Bourdais is going to get the spot into turn number one. He has a fast race car right now. <laughs> That's typically not a passing spot, but he had such a big run off the final corner as Jordan King now slowing and Santino Ferrucci going to pounce on him as well, so not sure if there's a mechanical issue for, for Jordan King or if he's just on a big fuel save at the moment trying to get into that two-stop window. Uh, Ryan hunter Ray currently has the fastest lap of the race at 118.0618 with 12 laps complete of the 70 we will run. New need to let you know Alexander Rossi is your leader. Will Power is second. Scott Dixon is third. Ed Jones is fourth. Graham Rahal is fifth. And as we give the full field rundown, we need to go to Nick Yeoman for an update because that's changed already, Nick. Yep, Ed Jones just grabbed the third spot with a nice pass around Scott Dixon. So move the young driver from Dubai into the top three. So Dixon goes to fourth. Rahal fifth. And Marco Andretti Beach, Laced, King, and Bourdais, the top 10. Ferrucci, 11th. Schultz, 12th. Kimball, 13th. Wickens, 14th. Hinchcliffe, 15th. Ryan Hunter Ray is 16th. Tony Ganon, 17th. Pagino is 18th. Joseph Newgarden, 19th. Gabby Chavez, 20th. Takuba Sato is 21st. Renee Bender, three laps down in 22nd. Spencer Piggott, four laps down in 23rd. Ryan Marine, you say it's time for Zach Veeps to come to pit road. It is time. He's in. He's got the red tires on. Sticker Black's going on. Fuel comes out, but Zach a little bit slow pulling away from his pit stop. That stopped a shade over eight seconds. Gabby Chavez was in a little while ago. They went to the Blacks as well. He said over the radio that tire wear is pretty extreme out there today. Uh, Scott Dixon under attack from Graham Rahal to turn six at Jake Query. 
former teammates. Now Graham Rahal trying to close in on Scott Dixon. Ed Jones, his current teammate, Nick, had cleared Dixon. Now Rahal's going to try to do what Jones did. Graham's going to close it within two car lengths, closes it within one, gets right up underneath the rear wing, but both drivers have to get on the brakes to make it to the right hander of turn seven, but still, Rahal all over the back of Dixon for fourth. An update from day first. Uh, Ed Jones definitely on the move. Just a couple of laps ago, he got on the radio and told Chip Ganassi and Barry Wanzer that, get this, Scott Dixon was holding him back. He got around Dixie. Now he has his sight sail in second place. And that's not a usual thing here. Scott Dixon is usually very, very good with saving his tires, but clearly Ed Jones must have found something in that car because he's actually doing laps six tenths quicker on the previous lap than Alexander Rossi. So Ed Jones at the moment absolutely flying, and he's catching Will Power in a hurry. Uh, Alexander Rossi has a lead of six seconds. Uh, just about six points. Five back is Ed Jones. Dixon eight seconds back. Ray hold nine point two seconds back. He is indeed an onboard now looking at Alexander Rossi exactly what he's doing. And I love the subtlety of the input on the hands that he's using here. He's got such a free car, a car that rotates so well. It's and it's basically the complete opposite of what we saw for Scott Dixon yesterday. Scott Dixon had to use very aggressive steering inputs on the wheel to make that thing turn. But the Andretti Autosport car a lot more positive as you call it so it rotates a lot more by itself and that requires a lot more of a finesse with your steering wheel input and, and just a beautiful thing to watch here for Alexander Rossi. A long pit stop for the 20 of Jordan King. Michael Young was there. That long is the understatement. About 18 seconds took forever for that front left had probably got it off but they couldn't get it back on. They got it fueled in just a very frustrating moment and that will put Jordan King deep into this field. Uh, Ed Jones I don't think he's done. Uh, he started to draw a bead on Will Power as they head down the main straightaway. Power has a lead of about three car lengths. He got a really good run off the final turn on Ed Jones, but Jones is now able to pick up the pace a little bit. Setting up for turn number two, they clear it, now make that short straightaway into turn number three, which is the right-hander. He breaks a little later, which allows him to pull the gap a bit. So, off of turn number five now, Scott Dixon, we see him a little farther back. He is trying to hold off Graham Rahal. So, Jake Query, all kind of action once the leader clears you. You know, the guy that I think right now might have the best car could be among those top, Ed Jones. Let's take a look at him, Nick, that blue NTT data machine. He seems to be able to put it where he wants. Right now, he wants to try to get up to Will Power in second. Everybody's still chasing Alexander Rossi through turn seven. Further back, Sebastian Bourdais. He'll pop to the outside. He'll get around Mateus Lace and very nearly right into the back of Marco Andretti. Boy, it's stacked up in a hurry down here in turn seven. Mark James thought we might see some carbon fiber flying, but everybody makes it through seven and eight. Uh, Bourdais likes his race car. That could be bad news for Marco Andretti. He's <laughs> next to the crosshairs. Uh, almost certainly. And keep in mind, Bourdais pitted early because of that uh, that early incident that, that had him uh, turned around. And, and now he's just charging through the field. And keep in mind, he is off strategy. So that means he can go a lot longer than anyone else around him right now. He can go probably another five, six laps longer than anyone else. So wouldn't be surprised to see him here. Just keep picking off spots as people pit. Yeah, well, he picked off one going into turn number one, and that was the 98 machine of Marco Andretti. Meanwhile, Mateus Laced is trying to do the same to the 98 machine. Going into turn number three, Laced is able to grab the spot. While they slug it out, Sebastian Bourdais is able to pull away a little bit. But Jake, just in front of them, the battle for fourth continues. That's Scott Dixon trying to hold off Graham Rahal. Again. Yeah, Rahal fourth. is right there. And then Bourdais able to close in, entering turn six on Graham Rahal. You can throw a blanket underneath these three as they work their way towards turn number seven. The uh, front three are already there. Here comes fourth place running Scott Dixon. He's got about a two-car length advantage over Graham Rahal. Rahal about a one-car length advantage over Sebastian Bourdais. Moves Santino Ferrucci up another spot as he gets around Marco Andretti as Marco starts to fade here. Kind of setting up for turn number eight right now. Pretty good battle just behind them. That's the battle for 13th between Hinch and Ryan Hunter Ray. These guys try to work their way through the field. Boy, Bourdais is really peddling for all it's worth. Sebastian Bourdais worked his way around Marco Andretti. Now he wants the fifth spot that's owned by Graham Rahal. And keep in mind, Sebastian Bourdais can be on full rich with the fuel trim, and he's going to go for another move into one. Can't quite pull that off, but 
Betcha into turn three. He's going to try and set it up. So, yeah, he's going to be hard on the push to pass button here. But, yeah, full rich on the fuel trim for Sebastian Bourdais. That's what going off strategy can do. It just enable you to run full bore for as long as you possibly can. So, Sebastian Bourdais is going to be loving this. Uh, so, here they come, Jake Query. But first, you'll see that battle between Will Power and Ed Jones. That's the battle for second. It's heating up as well. Right now, Power has the advantage over Jones. Both of them through turn number six. The other thing, Mark, here that is interesting. There is one large dark cloud. I don't think precipitation is going to be an issue, but this track has cooled tremendously here in this 5-6 area. Anders, I don't know how track sensitive or temperature sensitive this track is, but it is significantly cooler in this section. Yes, certainly something that will play in, especially as the rubber keeps coming down. If it, if it had kept heating up, the, uh, the oil would have come to the top of the rubber, making the track very greasy, but certainly cooling it down will actually help quite a lot as we now see Sebastian Bourdais so close to tagging in to the back of Graham Rayall here. Two corners to go to complete this lap, and then he's going to go for yet another attack, I think, down the front straightaway here. This is great stuff to watch from Sebastian Bourdais. Yeah, Bourdais gets an awfully good run off that final turn before they get to turn one, but this time Rayall is able to hold him off. So uh, we see Power continue to try to hold off Ed Jones just behind them. It's Scott Dixon, Graham Rayall, and Sebastian. Sebastian Bourdais. Uh, Ray Hall's right there. Dixon knows that he is. That one's through turn number four now. Bourdais stacking up behind them. Mateus Laced is the guy trying to keep pace as that battle goes back to turn six and Jay Query. I'll tell you what, right now Dixon is just trying his hardest to hold off Ray Hall and that allows Bourdais right there. Folks, literally, those three are by themselves, then Laced, and then you wait just a little bit before Ferrucci comes into view. Yep, they are no to tail, but I mean, they are closing in on each other through turn seven. One car length separating Dixon back to Ray Hall, but a half a car length from Ray Hall to Bourdais, and Anders is right. Bourdais is flat, wearing out that rear wing of Ray Hall. And I would not be surprised to see Alexander Rossi come into the pits this lap or the next because he is inside the window now for a two-stopper, and also he just set in a flying lap of a 118.8, so that's a, a sign that we're going to see someone pit is when they, when they just use up the last little bit of their fuel so he's not going to pit this lap the question is will he pit the next so i think he's exposing himself a little bit too much here by staying out for much longer uh, rossi has plenty of breathing room a lead of 5.7 seconds and jake we had talked about will power and ed jones i think power's got the best of that for now but just behind them dixon ray hall Bourdais, even Mateus Lace. Those cars are all but nose to tail, and I think Ferrucci's trying to join that fray as well, Jake. So Alexander Rossi is your leader. Then Power and Jones, as Mark had mentioned, and then yes, Mark. After that, it gets very hectic. Dixon, Graham Rahal. Bourdais going to try to take a look on Rahal. He might try to set him up in turn number seven. Sebastian Bourdais on the charge. They snake their way down the back stretch, and here comes Bourdais. He pops to the outside. Graham Rahal knows he's faster, and he heeds the position, so Sebastian Bourdais charges around Graham Rahal. Now he'll set his sights on fourth place running Scott Dixon. 19 of 70 laps complete here at Belle Isle. If you're looking for classic styling, the ultimate in protection and world-class customer service, then you are looking for Henchman. Henchman Racewear is the pioneer in driver suit technology, producing custom-made racing safety apparel for some of the biggest names in open-wheel racing. Henchman, stop by their store on Gasoline Alley Road. It's just one mile south of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Of course, you can find everything you need online at henchmanracewear.com. You love racing, but how do you get started? How do you get better? Level Up Racing School with championship winning instructors like former Daytona 24 winner Jim Pace and former Mopar factory driver Steve DeBrecht. Level Up Racing School will give you a solid foundation that will make you a better driver on the street and in the race car. Whether you want to get your SCCA license or have some fast fun, find dates and locations at levelupracingschool.com. That's levelupracingschool.com. From the streets of Belle Isle, this is the Advance Auto Parts IndyCar Radio Network. The Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum, located on the grounds of the greatest race course in the world, is now offering museum membership. As an Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum member, you will enjoy free admission, gift shop discounts, kiss the bricks track tours, 
plus benefits like invitations to programs and members-only exhibit events, like a first-look gala for the current exhibit, The Amazing Uncers, from Albuquerque to Indianapolis. For information on Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum memberships, go to IndyRacingMuseum.org. Here, IndyCar Racing. A.J. Foyt down the main straightaway. The checkered flag is out. A.J.'s hand in the air. 24-7. It's a drag race. They're side by side. John Cock and Bears. On IndyCarRadio.com. They're waving bandanas. Waving heads. Triple the left flag for racing immortality for 19-year-old Marco Andretti. And Sam Hornis Jr. right on the table. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week on IndyCarRadio.com. Or download the TuneIn app to your phone or tablet. From the Firestone Broadcast booth at Belle Isle, this is the Verizon IndyCar Series. Santino Ferrucci spun on the course. Looks like he's going to be able to get it restarted. We need to get some updates from Pit Road. Uh, let's see, he had just come off of Pit Road. Some debris on that car, some damage. He's dragging it along the racetrack with it. We'll keep an eye on that and head to Pit Road for updates, starting with Ryan Marine. Scott Dixon came in. He'd been sliding back, as we've been talking about on the broadcast. Uh, he is in and out in seven and a half seconds with black tires on. Santino Ferrucci was just on pit lane making his second stop. He came in under that early yellow, and right now Mateus Laced is laid out. He should be coming in shortly. Uh, let's go today first. Ed Jones hitting his mark, and the NTT Data Honda guy is going right to work. The reds come off, sticker blacks. That's another quick stop. Racing 8.4. Marco Andretti, Graham Rahal also getting service. That last time around. Michael Young. Alexander Rossi already down and away. A great stop for that crew. Ed Jones will follow out Will Power. Now James Hinchcliffe in for the second time this afternoon. They will go to Sticker Blacks for Stint number three. No problems for that stop. Hinchcliffe down and away. Joseph Newgarden putting a full round into that front wing. Good stop for Newgarden. Back to Ryan Marine. Mateus Laced had been running up in the top five when he came in. When Ferrucci had his issue, the crew scrambled to be in position for the pit stop. It was a fast one. Seven seconds for the number four ABC supply team. Back to day first. Takuma Sato with stop number two this afternoon. He started 20th. Isn't making up very very much ground at all. Remember he finished fifth yesterday. He's going to need a lot of help if that's going to happen again here today. And Ferrucci drove a big chunk of that front wing assembly all the way around the racetrack. Lucky it didn't come off. That prevented a full course cost. Yeah, and that's all thanks to that tether that's uh, connected to the front nose and the, and the front wing. And lucky, lucky, lucky for Alexander Rossi that a full course caution didn't come out. It could have so easily happen and that is exactly what happens when you, when you expose yourself by waiting so long to make your first stop so uh, lucky break there for Alexander Rossi to be able to, uh, to to stay up front. Back to Ryan Marie. Santino Ferrucci is in. He's brought his pace safe Honda to the attention of the Nail Point Racing team. They replaced the nose now he stalled the car leaving the pit stall so things have gone from bad to worse. They have the starter engaged. It's refired and Ferrucci pulls back out there but a promising day has gone to Ryan he had issues, none of his making yesterday. A little bit more difficult for the rookie today. Day first, Max Chilton's on pit road. Yep, three stopper this race for Max Chilton once again. Just completed stop number two still on those sticker black tires. Uh, we will give you a full field rundown, update the pit strategy. When we come back, we pause 10 seconds for stage identification. This is the Advanced Auto Parts IndyCar Radio Network. Welcome to Geico's Motorcycle Meanderings. Oh man, this is great. I sure saved a lot of money by switching to Geico. I scored some big savings and now I can use their mobile app 24-7 for all sorts of stuff. Life just makes sense now. What doesn't make sense is if a highway splits, it's a fork in the road, then wouldn't the long straight stretch be a knife in the road? And then wouldn't a cul-de-sac be a spoon in the road? What would a spork be? Geico Motorcycle. Savings that make sense. Firestone presents. 